Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Say, Amen. You can have a seat. Today, get your Bibles out and go with me to the wonderful book of Hebrews once again, Hebrews the 10th chapter. We're continuing our series on why church. This is part number three of why church. And don't worry if you missed part number one and two, you'll be able to Just track right where we're at today. This message will stand on its own for you. But we are going to build on some of the concepts, so I would encourage you to get a hold of the CDs or go online and uh, get those messages. They're absolutely free online. Uh, You can pick those up and and get some good stuff from the Word of the Lord in your heart. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse number 24 and verse number 25 says this. It says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, remember, we said that church is God's idea and church is God's plan. And last time we were together, uh, such an important message about not tearing what we wear, not dividing and separating and causing division in the body of Christ, but staying together, staying united. Like I said, we're going to build on those concepts today. Now, sometimes we don't understand the why of church because we really don't understand the what of what church really is. When we understand the why, then the what will come to us naturally. Are you listening today? So today I want to talk to you about a couple of things of what church is. Because if we get the what, then we'll understand the why. First thing for today, what the church is that we see in the Word of God is this. The church is the house of God. Church is the house of God. Maybe you've called, it, you've called it the house of God. Maybe you referred to it as that or heard it referred to as that. But let's take a look at it in the Bible. There is a law in the Bible, and, and if you're going to interpret Scripture, there's one of the, these laws, these things that we use in order to help us to interpret Scripture called the law of first use. And what the law of first use states is that as you see it for the first time in Scripture, for the most part, that's going to continue on throughout the Scripture, and that'll be the way that you see it for the rest of the Scriptures, okay? Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes things change. Sometimes, you know, especially at the cross, some things change. Some things are are fulfilled and stop at the cross. But for the most part, as you see something used in the first time in the Bible, you're going to see that go throughout the Bible. So let's take a look at the house of God in the Word. Back to Genesis. The first time we see the term the house of God is in the book of Genesis. Go there with me, Genesis chapter number 28. Genesis chapter number 28. As you're turning there, let me set up the story for you. A guy by the name of Jacob. You know Jacob. Jacob was kind of a rascal, right? He, his name means supplanter, and he, he and his character was, was true to that. He, he ended up getting a hold of his brother's birthright, and, and he took the blessing from his brother, and his brother was stark raving mad. I mean, this guy was just angry. He was wanting to kill him. So, so Jacob decides to flee, and he goes and he leaves under the pretense that he's going to go and find a wife, and indeed he does while he's on this trip that he's taking. So he heads out and flees from his brother. And on the way, he takes a trip and, 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 and it's, he's traveling through the wilderness and, and, and night falls, okay? It's time to go to bed. So what does he do? He, he pulls up a rock for a pillow. He lays down, puts that rock at his head and he falls to sleep and he has his famous dream. You know the dream is Jacob's ladder, right? Really, it's the ladder of God as we'll see in a moment. And Jacob has this dream and there's a ladder that goes all the way up into heaven. Angels are ascending and descending upon the ladder. There over the ladder, heaven opens up. And God starts to speak to Jacob, starts to declare the purpose, the plan of God, starts to give promises to Jacob. Now, Jacob wakes up, and this is where we pick up in Genesis, the 28th chapter, verse number 16 and verse number 17. Let's take a look at what Jacob says in Genesis chapter 28, starting in verse number 16. Look at this. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Verse 17, and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So as we see with the law of first use, what is the house of God? The house of God is that place where where now we can connect with God. There is that ladder that ascends into heaven so we can go up to God or God can get down to us. And now there is that place where heaven opens up and God starts to declare his wisdom. God starts to declare his counsel. God starts to declare his promises and his purposes for our lives. See, maybe you didn't know it, but surely the Lord is in this place today. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And we see in the New Testament, you know, you say that ladder. We see the ladder in the New Testament. Did you know that? You said, Pastor, I never saw the ladder in the New Testament. Oh, yeah. 
Jesus declared to Nathanael that, Nathanael, you shall see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. See, Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. See, if we're going to get to the Father, or if the Father's going to get to us, he's going to use the avenue of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus is that ladder. When we gather together in his name, now Jesus is in our midst. Now heaven can open up, and God starts to speak to our lives. Heaven is open over this place today. God is speaking to our hearts. That's why we say we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman. We came to hear from Almighty God himself. 1 Timothy chapter 3, turn there with me in the New Testament. Let's see how the law plays out in the New Testament. Remember, for the most part, what you see in that first use is what you're going to see throughout 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul's writing to the young pastor, Timothy. He starts to talk to him about some things. He says, I want to come to you. I want to be there with you. I want to, I want to tell you about some things. 1 Timothy, the third chapter. Verse number 15, he says, but if I am delayed, I write. So that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. There it is once again. Now he defines it, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So we see that the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of truth. Well, well hold on a second. Hold on a second. What is truth then? See, our, our society, our culture has defined truth as whatever you call truth to be. Oh, that may be your truth, but I have my truth. Uh, you know, this group over here has their truth. And, and truth ends up being just kind of fluid. It, it just kind of is whatever works for, for that individual. Or if you can reproduce it a certain number of times, that would be a truth. They would say that's a truth, you know. And, and, and sometimes people's truth is based on circumstances or evidence. You know, that may be your truth, but, but this happened to me. Therefore, that's not my truth. But the problem is if truth can change with circumstances, that means that it is not a pillar or a ground. See, a pillar is something that holds something up. And a ground is a foundation. It's got to be steadfast. It's got to be immovable. So that can't be truth according to what the Bible says. See, truth according to the Bible is what God says. It's outside of my circumstances. It's outside of my control. It's outside of my experience now. Now, truth is strong. Truth is stable. Truth is eternal. Why? Because Jesus said, my word is truth. Therefore, truth is whatever God says. So how does this apply to that law of first use? Well, remember, heaven opened up. God spoke his promises. God spoke his word at Bethel, the house of God. So now we see that the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of truth. That means that it's in church. It's in the house of God that you're going to hear the truth of God. And that's going to hold up your life because it's the truth of God. And it's going to settle you. It's going to be strong and stable because it's that, that ground of truth. It's the foundation that you're building your life upon the rock. And you won't be moved throughout your life because it's not based on you based on him and his eternal word hallelujah you're there in first timothy chapter three turn with me past the book of hebrews past hebrews you'll find the book of james past the book of james you'll find first peter first peter when you get to first peter go to chapter two so we're seeing the house of god we're seeing what happens in the house of god heaven opens up god speaks to us in the house of god he declares his word and his truth now in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5, he goes on and explains the house of God even further. See, is the house of God just the church? Is it just the walls of this place? Is it this building? Is it the, the metal and the, the drywall and the screws and the nails, the electrical and all that kind of stuff? That's the church? Ah, let's take a look at it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5, take a look at it with me. It says, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, there's that ladder again. We're going to offer our lives. We're going to offer sacrifices to God, the fruit of our lips, thanksgiving to God. We're going to offer up good works and, and, and sharing and, and all those things that the Bible defines as spiritual sacrifices. They're made acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, through the avenue of the ladder, Jesus himself. He takes our praise and he presents it before God as our high priest. So you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. That means it's not the four walls of this building. See, if you didn't show up today, there wouldn't be no church. Even though there would still be a building, there would be no church. Why? Because individually, yes, we're Christians, but gathered together as we are the ecclesia, the gathered assembly. Now, we are the church. 
That means you and 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 me. We are all living stones. See, when you were born again, God selected you. God carved you out of the side of the mountain now. And God took you. God formed you. God shaped you. And God knew you before he ever formed you in your mother's room. And God selected you. And when you gave your heart and life to Jesus and were born again, he took you as a living stone. And he sets you in a place in the house of God. You have a place in the house of God. God assigned you. God lined you up with Jesus, who is the chief cornerstone. And now God has placed you in the house of God. That's why the Bible says in the Psalms that those who are planted in the house of God shall flourish in the courts of the Almighty. See, you have a place. Maybe you didn't know it, but you're valuable. Maybe you didn't know it, but God has selected you. God has carefully placed you in the house of God. And we've got to stay in our place, church. We've got to line up with where God wants us. God, is this where you want me? Then God, this is where I'm staying. God, unless you move me, God, I am not going anywhere. I'm lining up with Jesus. It's your word. It's your will. It's your way. I am here in the house of God. Now, you remember we said that church is God's idea and God's plan, and Jesus said that he'd build his church, Right? So that means that this spiritual house that God is building, that means that God himself, the Father, he's the architect. It's God's idea, it's God's plan. He, he's the architect. He, he dreamed it up. He, he saw it. Jesus himself is the builder. He'd be like the contractor, right? Here he is coming in, and Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So here Jesus is building the church. He's selecting the stones. He's placing them in the house of God. And then finally, the Holy Spirit is the dweller of the church. He's the occupant. He's the one that comes inside and lives inside of that spiritual house. Now, you know in the, the book of 1 Corinthians, it says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the house of God yourself. You house Almighty God on the inside of you. The Spirit of Christ lives on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit, when you were born again. But all of us together now, the Spirit of Christ dwells amidst His church, and now we are together the spiritual house of God. But we're not a, a dead house. We're not like a dead stone that can't move. No, we are a living house that can move and that can breathe and that can do and that can act, which brings us to the second thing that I want to take a look at today. What the church is, number two, we are the body of Christ. You'll find that all throughout the New Testament, that we are the body of Christ. Let's take a look at it. We read this from the book of Ephesians chapter one. Turn there with me. Ephesians, the first chapter. The last time we read this, we read it in the message, but let's look at it in the New King James today. Ephesians, the first chapter, verse number 22 and verse number 23. Take a look at it with me. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 starts out speaking of God, what he did with Jesus. And he, God, put all things under his feet, Jesus, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now, in the next verse, he defines what the church is. Look at this. Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we as the church, we are the body of Christ. And just like as you see a man, you know that there is a spirit, right? We're made in the image of God, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the same way, man is a three-part being. We are spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit who has a soul, mind, will, and emotions, and you live in this earth suit, this body. Now, you know that there's a spirit. Why? Because you see the physical representation of a person that's living, breathing, moving, acting, doing, right? So in the same way as the church... As God has placed us in the body, now as the body is coming together and doing its part, living, breathing, acting, moving, doing, though they can't see Jesus, though they can't see the Spirit, see, He's the invisible God, and now Jesus, our head, has ascended and is seated at the right hand of God. He left the church on the earth. Why? Because we are the physical representation. We are the body of Christ. We are a visual example of Jesus Christ on the earth. Are you listening today? See, maybe you hadn't thought about it that way, but you are the living proof of a living God. You are the one. See, they won't see Jesus, but they'll see your life. They won't see the eternal Father, but they're going to see a church that's loving. They won't see his character, his nature, and attributes, but as you reach out and as you go and do the works of God, they're going to see Jesus at work on the earth in his church. We are the body of Christ. Let's take a look at it together in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. See, we are body, we are members of one another. We respond to the head. See, no one's better than anybody else. It's not about a hierarchy and I'm better than you and this and that. No. 
See, in, in our American society, we have what we like to call independence. We think that we don't need anybody. It's just us. We don't, we don't need you. We don't need this. We, don't, we can do it on our own. We've got this independent spirit. God has called us to be, number one, dependent on only one, Him, Him alone. We are dependent on God. I need God. Every day, every hour, every moment, every breath, I need God. We are dependent on God. But I am not independent in my life from other people. God has not called us to independence or even dependence where I just need you. No, God has called us to something else called interdependence. What is that? That's where you need me and I need you. We need each other. We're connected to each other. See, just as the body is all connected, we are connected as the body of Christ. Let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians 12th chapter, starting in verse number 14. 1 Corinthians 12th chapter, verse number 14 says, For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? We could answer and say that. No, of course it's part of the body. Verse 16, If the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Again, we would say, no, of course it's a part of the body. And yet sometimes we think because I'm not standing in a pulpit area, because I'm not up front, because I'm not singing, because I'm not on the platform, I'm not a part of the body of Christ. Oh no, God has placed you in the body right where you're at because God not only has a place for your life, but God has a purpose for your life. Let's read on and see that. Verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Can you just see God with a big smile on his face, with his good pleasure saying, I'm going to put you over here. And, and you know what? This person listens really good. They're an ear right over here. And you know what? This person's really strong. They're the arm. They're, this person, they're stable, man. They are the backbone. This guy's got a big mouth. I'm going to put him as the preacher. And then, and then this person over here, see, see, and God, God's just smiling over your life. And God's just setting you in order and putting you. You have a place, but you also have a purpose. Wow. Verse number 19, and if they were all one member... Where would be the body? See, we're on big nose walking around. That would just be weird, right? See, we, we need each other. Verse 20, but now indeed there are many members, yet one body. Verse 21, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. See, we need each other. I can't say as a pastor, well, I don't need you guys. No, you guys don't show up. I don't got anybody to preach to. I need you guys. See, and God's given me a purpose, and God's given me a reason for being here. And guess what? If I don't show up, hey, you guys need me. And we'll see this in the, in, in the Word as we continue on. See, we need each other. If someone didn't show up to watch the kids, if someone didn't show up to preach on the streets, someone didn't show up to drive the buses, see, this would not happen if we didn't all show up and we didn't all do our parts. I can't say I don't need you any more than you can say you don't need me. We need each other equally. Look at verse 22. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. Look at this. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it. And think about God as the composer. If you think in musical terms, here God is and he hears these wonderful, these wonderful orchestral arrangements. And God has, has this, this opus, this, this wonderful song in his heart. And so God starts to dream, and then God starts to plot it out and plan it. And he can hear the drums and the timpanies and the, and the cymbals clanging and crashing and the crescendos and the day crescendos. And God hears the harmonies. And so God starts to place the violins and the first chairs and the, and the flutes. And he starts to place these things together. And then he hears, he hears the, the harmonies coming in with the melody and coming together. And so he starts to put the, the, the woodwinds and the brass winds and all these things together. And then as we, the church, respond to the great composer and the great conductor of the church, Jesus Christ. Now, as he moves, we move. And as each one of us does our part, we play this wonderful song of God that is lifted up to the pleasure of God and to the glory of God to a lost and dying world. Wow. Verse 25, that there should be no 
schism. You guys remember that word from last week? Be no division. We don't tear what we wear. When you are set in the body, when you are standing in your place, when you're doing your job, when we link up shoulder to shoulder for the glory of God and we stand in our spot and we do our part, I'm doing mine, you're doing yours, then now there is no division, there is no schism in the body. We don't tear what we wear and we don't rend the power of God off of our lives any longer. No, now we are strong, now we are stable, now we can see the prayers of Jesus coming to pass, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the greater works are coming because now the church is united and we're doing our parts in the body of Christ. There'd be no schism in the body but that the members have, should have the same care. For one another. Look at this, verse 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. We saw that today. You know, here we are at the altar. People are weeping at the altar. I didn't have a tear in my eyes until I saw the tears at this altar. And all of a sudden, oh, my heart ached. Why? Because I was hurting? No, because they were hurting. See, a, a great example is you ever been up in the middle of the night? And you're going to get a drink of water, you have to go to the bathroom, something like that. And maybe you're like me. And when I wake up, I'm not up. I may be walking, but, you know, it's kind of like the living dead. I'm just kind of going, and I don't even know how I'm moving. And, and, and you know, you, maybe you're a little uneasy, right? And you walk past the bed, and there your toe happens to connect. <laughs> See, the toe will move, but the bed doesn't move. <laughs> Anybody that's ever had that happen knows that even, the, and you, you, you never bump the big toe, is that right? It's always that little guy out there off to the side. <laughs> and even though it's a tiny, teeny tiny little member of your body, the whole body, even though you weren't alive before, you are definitely alive now. And you had to stop and shove back down that high school word that was trying to come up out, right? Like, uh, uh. Bless God. Whoa. Yow. See, it doesn't matter how insignificant it seems. The moment, the moment you get a paper cut, my goodness, somebody just stabbed me with a knife instead of giving me a paper cut. That hurts. Little teeny tiny thing, and you're going, oh my gosh, I need surgery, you know? Why? Because when one member hurts, the whole hurts with it. But, but also, when one part rejoices, oh, the whole rejoices. We were just rejoicing this morning. Some people got healed in the church. We were so excited in prayer, just rejoicing. Uh, saw that there's a, a, a church that's, that's doing great things all over the world, and secular companies have now decided to make a movie about them. Oh my goodness, I'm rejoicing. Look at the, the body of Christ being shown to the world on their dollar. Oh, that's so cool. I'm so excited about that. You know what the number one album in the nation is right now? It's a Christian rapper. All that Christian music is substandard, you know, it's just junk, it's not as good as the world. Excuse me, the church of Almighty God is starting to rise up and starting to show, no, we've got the Spirit of God. We're more creative, we can do better, we can do more. God is the one who gave it to us, he, and if God anoints, man, I'm rejoicing. I was so excited to see that because now he's getting national recognition. See, that's how it ought to be, church. Church ought to be culture forming and culture changing and rearranging as the church of Almighty God. We are the ecclesia. We make the decisions. We make the call. And we influence instead of being influenced. We don't allow sexual, se secular culture in. We don't allow the sexual culture either, but we don't allow secular culture in. But we get into the culture we influence. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Look at this, verse 27. Now you are. Everybody say, I am. I See, you've got to start changing the way you think about yourself. You didn't just show up to sit on the sidelines. You came to play. You are a participant in this thing. You are the body of Christ and members individually. You are the body of Christ and members individually. See, each one of us has a place and a purpose given to us by God. It, last, last section of scripture, sorry, I got a lot of scripture for you, but I, I believe that you can handle it. Ephesians chapter 4, he already got through the biggest section of scripture. Ephesians 4, let's take a look at it, verse number 11 through verse number 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11, verse number 16. How does this work? How does this look? All right, the word of God is very clear. Pastor, I see it. I know it now. I see the what, I, but, 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 and, and I understand the why now, but, but now, now i got another question. How? How do we do this? Look at this. Ephesians 4, chapter, verse number 11. Look at this. Talking about Jesus, the head. 
and he himself gave some. Everybody say some. some. Not for everybody. But guess what? That's okay. Because we're going to see where everybody's at in a moment. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why did God do that? Why didn't he just make everybody the same thing? Here's why. Look at this. Verse 12, there's a purpose. There's a reason why God placed some. Because they're better? Oh, no. No, they're not better. Here's why. Verse 12. For the equipping of the saints. Do you know that when you were born again, you're no longer that old rank sinner? God looks at you. He doesn't see the old man anymore. Not just a sinner saved by grace. Yeah, that's who you were. But guess what? Now you're born again. That old man is dead. And now there's a new man risen up to life with Christ. Now you are a saint of Almighty God. That's you. That's you. So God says, I gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints. When you now start to sit under the ministry, when you get into a healthy church, and when you start to sit under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, as it comes through that fivefold ministry gift that God has given to the church, now every time you come to church, you get another tool in your belt. You leave this place equipped and ready to go out, and you can do more. You can be more. You can love more. You can give more. You can serve more. See, why? Because you got equipped in the house of God. Oh, but it gets better. Look at the verse. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Wait, 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 wait. I, I thought it was just, just the pastors that did the work of the ministry. What are we paying them to do if not that? I thought it was just the people that got up in the pulpit that were the full-time ministers. Oh, no, 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 no. Our job is to equip you so that you can do the work of the ministry. Even though you're not getting paid by the church, guess what? Each and every one of you born of the Spirit of God is a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. See, God has a place, but God also has a purpose. There is a gift that's been given to you. God knew you. God formed you in your mother's womb. He saw you. He said, man, this person has a purpose. This person has a destiny. I've got plans for their life. My goodness, and whatever it is God has put in your hand to do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, the Bible says. And now you serve the Lord. You get equipped, and you go out there, and you do the work of the ministry. What happens when we do that? For the edifying of the body of Christ. See, when you do the work of the ministry, when you go out there and do your part, serving, loving, giving, whatever it is, reaching out, now all of a sudden it edifies the body of Christ. What's edify mean? It means to build up. You think of the word edifice, right? It's the same root word. It edifies the body of Christ. You have a direct impact on building the body of of Christ. You can cause growth. You can fill in seats in this church. You can pack the parking lot in this church. Maybe you never thought of it that way, but that's what God thought of before we thought of it. God's intent and purpose is not that the pastors and the preachers should grow the church. No, we equip the church, and then the church goes out and does the work of the ministry, and it causes growth to the body of Christ. That's the system God set up. See, if, if just the people that were paid by the church did this, we would only have a, a minimal impact, minimal effect. But when all of us, now when the thousands of people get mobilized into being the full-time ministers and doing the work of the ministry, now all of a sudden you have a multiplied impact. Listen, we can take this valley, we can take this nation, we can take this world for Jesus Christ. All because we stayed in our spot and we did our job. Let's read on. Look at this, verse 13. Till we all come to the unity, not division, to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. Some of your translations say to a complete Man, that's what we're doing to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let me ask you, so how big is Jesus? How big is your God? See, as the church, it's our job not to be slumped over and hunched over. Oh, well, we're just beaten, battered saints, and I guess we're going to someday get to have the power of God when we go to heaven. No, 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 no. Get in your place. Get in your position. Get in your purpose. Do your job, and as you do, it will cause growth to the body, and you will edify and build up the body of Christ. Because why? We're standing up into the head, shoulders back, arms out, chest puffed out. We are ready for action, ready to respond to Jesus, our head. Why? Because we have built up the body of Christ because we did our part. 
Verse number 14 comes along and says this, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. See, we need to be aware that there are people out there who are going to try and tear apart the body of Christ. They're going to try and rend the garment, try and get us ineffective. The Apostle Paul warned the Ephesian elders that savage wolves would rise up from among you, not sparing the flock. We've got to be careful because there's an unholy trinity at work, our own flesh... Sometimes we'll want to get out of it. We won't want to do it. We won't want to be nice. We won't want to be connected. We won't want to serve. We won't want to do our... We can get lazy. Hey, I can get lazy. My goodness, I'm not just telling this to you. I'm telling this to myself. See, we've got to watch ourselves. But also, there's a devil out there that hates us, and we need to stand steadfast firm in the faith and resist him. But also, the world systems, there will be people who are well-meaning or who call themselves Christians that will rise up and cause division. Now, we think, oh, well, we're supposed to love one another, and we're supposed to be kind and caring. We, you know, we'll just tell them, oh, I forgive you, and I love you. Don't worry. No. The Bible says mark those people. You warn them if they're divisive, and after that, if they still won't listen to you, you have nothing to do with them. That's Bible, guys. See, if we did that, we would be guarding the body of Christ, not rending or tearing what we wear, but now staying in unity and oneness, not allowing those divisions. We can't afford to divide. See, people divide over all sorts of, well, I got offended in church. Yeah, guess what? We're also called the family of God in the Bible. Did you know that? And just because weird Uncle Harry offended you at Thanksgiving dinner when Christmas rolls around, you're still going to go sit next to weird Uncle Harry. (laughs) You don't get to choose. And just because of offense, you move past it. Why? Because we're relatives. We're blood. You know? And that's just how it is. And yet in church, all of a sudden we think, oh, my goodness, they offended me. And then we bounce out. No, you don't get to choose. We're family. We're connected. It's no longer you and me. It's us. It's we now. We're connected. And listen, there may be some weird people might be sitting next to you. Don't look, okay? But, 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 but doesn't matter. Next time church comes around, you're going to be sitting next to them. Why? Because they're your brother. They're your sister. And you're connected by blood, the blood of Jesus. Can't divide over these things. We've got to stand together, church can't divide over race. There's no longer black or white or brown or any other color. Now there's one race. It's the human race. And now we're all connected by the blood of Jesus. We are one race in him. We are one in him. And now, oh my goodness, we are the body of Christ. We've got to move on. Got to move on. Verse 15, but speaking the truth and love, that's how you handle it. That's how you handle the offense. Go to your brother. Go tell him, I love you and I'm hurt. Let's walk in forgiveness. Let's work this thing out. That's what the Bible says, speaking the truth in love. Not, not speaking the truth without love. I'm just going to tell them what's on my mind. They, they're going to get a peace right now. <laughs> oh, I'll tell them the truth. <laughs> no, speaking the truth in love. You may be right and do it the wrong way. Might win the argument, but you'll lose the sale. Speaking the truth in love may grow up. That's what this is about. Let's be mature as Christians. Let's not divide and let's not be petty. Let's love one another. Let's stick together. We need each other, especially in these last days. May grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. By what every joint supplies according to the effective working, not ineffective, effective working. When you do your part, when I do my part, now all of a sudden we're a well-oiled machine. We're a healthy body. Now the blood is flowing. Now this stuff is going. Air is being breathed in and out. Things are being said. Things are being done. And we are healthy. We are affected by the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Maybe you never thought that you had with your life a direct impact on the growth of the church, but you do. Why? Because God has a place and God has a purpose for your life. You are the body of Christ. You are the house of God. See, if we understand the what, then we'll understand why. How important is it that we do our part? How important is it that we get into church and find out the plan of God for our lives, use our gifts, volunteer and serve? I'm going to close with this. I have a statement I'm going to put up on the overhead. It says this, I have a place and a purpose that God has given me in church. Can you say that with me? I have a place and a purpose that God has given me in church. Come on, say it a little louder. I have a place and a purpose that God has given me in church. Oh, come on, get a little San Bernardino on it now. I have a place and a purpose that God has given me in church. Can we give the Lord a great big praise today? Hallelujah. I'm going to talk to you guys about your eternal life. 
It'd be a tragedy if we came to this place, had such a good time as we did. And then we let you go, and your heart wasn't right with God. You died, you ended up in hell, and didn't go to heaven. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I, you know, I don't believe in hell. That's just like a fairy tale that people tell their children to scare them into being good. Problem with that thing is, do you know that all throughout the Bible it talks about hell, Old and New Testament? Jesus himself spoke of hell, and so therefore it's a very real place. You have to face the reality of it. And let's make sure that you don't go there, because God never intended it for you or I. God intended it for the devil and his angels who rebelled. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven, so I don't have to worry about that. You know, you just stick to your truth, I'll stick to my truth. You know, the churches out there, the religions, they have their own truth, and if they just stay true to themselves, they'll all end up in some place one way or another, and it'll be all good. But we talked about that today, didn't we? Because it doesn't matter your experience or your circumstance. That's not truth. Truth is what God says. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, went to the cross, a beaten, bloody mess. After he did all that, don't you think he would tell us how to get to heaven? See, we can't get there your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Can't get there any other way but God's way. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's good news, Pastor, because, you know, I know that the Bible says just be good and you get to go to heaven. The problem with that thinking is, could you show that to me in the Bible where it says you can just be good and you get to go to heaven? Because you can't be good enough. Nowhere in the Bible does it say just be good and God will let you into heaven. How good do you have to be? Is there a grading scale in the back behind the maps? Or, you know, is there, there a line that you have to be above, be this good, and then you get to go to heaven? It's nowhere in the Bible to say just be good. In fact, what the Bible says is all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it there on your own good works. The Bible compares our goodness to God's goodness like filthy rags. That means they're going to get thrown out. They're not going to get to stay. can't just be good and think that you're going to get to go to heaven. Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian headed for heaven? No, because did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that your parents raised in church tell you a Christian that makes you a Christian? No, the Bible just say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry like a cross or St. Christopher, but that gets you right with God. No, the Bible say be baptized or christened as a child or be born in America, that America is the Christian nation and everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion that by default, God lumps you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Now, sometimes people say, well, okay, pastor, I get that, but you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Because I'm sitting in church and I consider myself to be a Christian. Well, no, it doesn't. Any more than you can go to your garage, sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. We all understand that. We all know that. And yet, what makes us think it's any different that we sit in church and call ourselves a Christian? That makes us a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, well, okay, I, I get that. But my last church, I got involved. I helped out. You were talking about doing your part. I did my part. I went above and beyond. I volunteered. I served. That's great. I'm glad you did those things, but just show that to me in the Bible where your volunteerism, you're helping out, maybe you carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions, taught in the Bible classes, sang in the choir, got a membership card to a church. Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible say you're volunteering, you're serving or helping out in church gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, well, okay, pastor, I, I get that. I understand that. But somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Easter and the resurrection every year of my life. Sing the songs at Christmas. I could quote scriptures to you, pastor. Great, I'm glad you can do those things. But could you just show that to me in the Bible? In fact, if you'd read your Bible, you know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and believes that he's the Son of God and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. Having mental assent towards God, knowing who he is, and that gets you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day who was a good guy. Let me tell you about him for a second. Good guy, did a lot of good deeds, raised up in his church. He attended there. He got involved there. In fact, he became one of the leaders. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? He could debate the scripture. And yet when Jesus comes and they're talking about the same subject, how do you get to heaven? Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Just that simple. You must be born again. Now, many times people turn off at that term, being born again. They've seen that in movies, Hollywood television, books and the internet. They've made it out to be some weirdo thing. And yet, let's not let society and 
movies, Hollywood, television, books, and the internet decide for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible define what being born again is. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down. A little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you need to do this, need to give God all your heart, need to give God all of your life. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And pop my hands together. When you hear this sound of my hands popping together, just like that. Bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Hold on. Time out. Let me get this straight. You're going to point at me and count? If, if I do that, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's, let's get past that today. Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Listen, I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. Count it. You can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. No one's that dumb. Yet the devil thinks that you are today. You tell that devil to go jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God today. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today, come on, make sure. Hands are already getting ready to go up. We'll do it all at the same time in a moment. Who should raise their hand? Not sure about your salvation. Today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm? You know, that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, get ready to get your hand up. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Today is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, across the nation and around the world. God's watching, God sees, get ready to get your hand up. And if you're online, you can click the button that says, Respond to God. Or if you don't see it, go to our homepage and click the button that says, Know God. And you can know God, someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. There's three, four. Thank you. Five. Thank you. God bless you. Up on top. Six, seven, eight. Thank you. On this side. Eight. Where you at? Just raise up your hand high for me. Eight. Nine up there. Gotcha. Over here. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Thank you. Who else today? 15 up top. Thank you. God bless you. Gotcha up there. Thank you. 15. Wise people. Anybody else real quick? You're saying, man, I wonder if I should do this. Oh, yeah, you should. Come on. Let's go for God today. That's you. 15 wise people. I didn't embarrass them. And I won't embarrass you. Is there anybody else? Need to give God all your heart? Need to give God all of your life? I'm just going to look through one more time. And if that's you and I'm looking in your direction, just pop your hand up and wave it at me. Anybody else? Anybody else on this side? In this center section? Anybody else up on top? Anybody else? Thank you. 16. God bless you. Who else? Anybody else on this side over here? Anybody else? All right. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for about 16 wise people. Hallelujah. God just spoke to me right now. There's four more of you. You didn't raise your hand, but you should have. It's not too late. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout. As we do that, once you get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, your Bible, your purse, get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that until we get you down here. So no one leave during this time. We're trying to get people to come forward. Very hard to do that when you're going that way. So let's let them come. Let's all stand and welcome them. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now. Come on down. Come on down. God just has to are. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. And hear the Spirit call. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Just come just as you are. From the family rooms, you can bring your children. They're welcome during this time. You just come on down. Just come on down. Come receive. 
Oh, they're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. You can come too. Come on, come on, come on. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. Today is your day. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. That's right. Just make your way to the front right now. They're still coming. Come on, just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Hallelujah. You can come too. Come on, just make your way to the front. All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front, look up here for a second. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Came to give God all of your heart. Came to give God all of your life, all right? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. See this guy waving at you right over here to my right, your left? This is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, he's cool. Nothing weird. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. Give you some free information, some free literature to help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then I'll introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers that'll help you to get strong in the way of the Lord. It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it, all right? He'll describe how it works, then I'll let you come right back out. Now listen, I want to make a promise to you guys. Give us one year of your life here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center, sitting under the teaching consistently. We have 11 church services a week just for you guys. We're working hard for you guys. Get into as many of those church services during the week as you can. And after that year and for the rest of your life, you'll look around and you'll say, my goodness, I didn't know I could be this blessed. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Cool. Take their word for it, okay? You guys make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.